Hello outside, here's Jürgen again from Metal Crash Radio. I have the big honor and the pleasure to talk to someone who's since four decades in the rock business, Mr. Mike Ray. Hi, good Hello. evening. Absolute pleasure to be here. Nice to meet you. Some of you may know him from, he was in a couple of bands like um, Dorian Gray, Skin, Red, White and Blues, UFO for a short time. We will later on maybe touch this a little bit. Um, so how did you start with making music? Did you start as, as a little boy with playing guitars? Yeah, very much. I mean, I was always attracted to music, um, but the big turning point in my life where I suddenly realized that this, this world that I wanted to know more about was when I first heard an English punk band called the Sex Pistols. And, you know, up until then, I just, music was something that was going on and I enjoyed it, but there was something about the punk movement which spoke to me as like a 10 year old kid. And it was like this aggressive guitar and it was a song called Pretty Vacant. And I always remember these like opening notes and it's just kind of like something that just opened the door in my mind. It was like, how, how, how does that sound get made? And it was the first music that spoke to me. It was kind of like, it was full of this anger and intensity and it made me very curious. And so then I, I sought out bands like the Sex Pistols, the Clash and Generation X and the Stranglers. And I was very much into punk music. And I was, you know, just kind of like listening to that. And then someone who was a friend of my brother's, he bought round a box of cassettes um, and he sold them to my stepfather. And because I was very curious about music, I just went through all of these cassettes and there was about 40 of them. I'm talking old school, little, little cassette. <laughs> yeah. And it was like a whole bunch of bands that I'd never heard of. And they had names like Genesis and Yes and Emerson, Lake and Palmer. And I was just gradually working my way through all of these cassettes. And then I picked up one and I looked at it and I thought they were like two, I thought maybe they were Dutch or German or because they had names that I, I associated with Europeans. And one of them was called Montrose and one was called Van Halen. And so I put this, this cassette in and just put it on. And then I heard Van Halen one for the first time in my life. And it, it was to this day, I've never heard a piece of music have this effect on me in my life because it was literally like the skies opened, the sun shone and all of a sudden I knew instantly what I wanted to do with my life and it was to make music like this. And from that ex precise moment, I became obsessed with music and it's an obsession that's never really left me. Um, so while the Sex Pistols were the band that sort of went, hey, there's this thing called punk music and rock music. It was the first Van Halen album, which changed my life 100%. I totally understand what you say. I have it still, Van Halen 1 vinyl. It was also one of my my first uh, vinyls that I bought. Mm -hmm. And it was the same thing. I, I, I switched it on and it was it blew me away. From the first riff, from the first tune, it blew me away. It was awesome. I mean, for the first three years, I listened to that album every single day. Like every single day. It, it was just, I got a guitar. And all of a sudden it was like, I have to learn how to do this, you know? And then once I discovered Eddie Van Halen, then there was, I suddenly realized there was this whole other world, which I was completely unaware yeah. of. And that's when I discovered bands like UFO, Led Zeppelin, Deep Purple, and, and then the world of rock opened up to me. And then, you know, obviously, you know, it's my passion and in life, you know, everything to do with, guitars and rock music but it started with Van Halen but it very quickly migrated out to everything else um, and then I've spent my whole life just um, wanting to be part of it and honored to be part of it. Sounds like an early plan <laughs> I would say. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I mentioned in the introduction a couple of bands that you were in. Um, I did logically some research about you, about your history, about what you've done I've listened also through your music, through all the things you did. Um, and I was uh, 
pretty, pretty amazed, to be honest. Uh, I asked myself since then <laughs> uh, how I could miss that. I don't know. I mean, I, I grew up in the 70s and uh, the 80s. And um, for some reason, you cannot know each and every band. Yeah. But um, I can't understand why I missed this, to be honest. So uh, could you tell us a little bit maybe about the bands, about your experiences? Well, my first, my, my big break or the big turning point in my life was I was thinking, I think I was about 13 years of age and my sister was involved in the music industry and she used to run a club called the Zigzag Club and there used to be all these bands playing and there would be bands like Diamond Head and Tank and uh, Angel Witch and there was like all these these heavy metal bands would be playing there and, uh, and Bernie told me who was the guitar player for Gillen, who then went on to be the guitar player for Ozzy Osbourne. Yeah. He was, he was playing a show there. And um, basically my sister became friends with Bernie Tormey's tour manager. And she told him that, oh, my brother plays guitar. And, and for somehow it got, um, Bernie Tormey agreed to come to my house when I was 13 and give me a guitar lesson, you know, and, you know, I'm just a little boy with a, with a little Les Paul copy and a yeah. little five watt practice. <laughs> and then I get told that one of my heroes is coming to my house, you know, cause I'd seen Bernie on television on top of the park, yeah. you know, he had that zigzag on his cheek. <laughs> he was doing all of this stuff and he was like one of my heroes. And so I couldn't believe that he was coming to my house. And I lived in this little council estate in London and I remember seeing this car pull up and seeing all of this blonde hair get out. And Bernie was very tall. He was about six foot one. And I'm quite small. And I, and I was tiny when I was, when I was 13. And he, he came into my, my bedroom and he said, I hear you want to be a guitar player. So for about two hours, he showed me how to hammer on and he showed me how to hit harmonics and you know, what a tremolo arm did. And he showed me the riff to Crazy Train and, and all these things. And I thought it was like a, like a dream. I just couldn't believe it. Um, and then at the end of it, he said, well, would you like to come to a band rehearsal with my band and you can see what happens? And he said, then bring your guitar too. And so I got to go to rehearsals for two days. And what happened was Bernie Tommy would run through his set and then at the end of it, he said, well, now get up and jam. And he showed me this song by Alice Cooper, which was a song called Under My Wheels. And he taught me this song. And at the end of each practice, I would get up and play Under My Wheels with the band. And to me, it was like the greatest thing in the world. And this happened for two days. And then at the end of the second day, he said, well, you know, you've done really, really great. Would you like to get up and play with me at the Marquee Club? Um, and I'm like, yeah, oh. it'll be a dream. <laughs> you know, so my first, I'd never even been to a gig. It was the first gig I'd ever been to. It was the London Marquee Club. There was 800 people. And then oh, cool. at, at the end of the set, he brought me on stage and we played under my wheels. Now, obviously this, once that happens in somebody's life, it's something that you never forget. And, yeah. so, and so now it was like my, my path was sealed. And it was like, from that moment on, even though I was obsessed beforehand, I'd become another level of obsession after that. And so then years go by and I'm, I spend all my time trying to write songs and get a band together. And then I get an invitation and I start to build up my own reputation as a guitar player. And I got into the um, attention of Metal Hammer, which was obviously a very big yeah. magazine. And they were doing a concert in London and they had UFO as the headline band, but they didn't have a guitar player. And so, and I, I can't remember the name. He was the editor of, of Metal Hammer. I can't, I can't remember his name. It's a long time ago. And um, he approached UFO and said, we'd like you to headline. And they said, well, we don't have a guitar player at the moment. And the editor of Metal Hammer said, well, we hear about this young guitar player in England. Wow. Why don't you contact him? Because we think he would be good. And they did contact me. Um, at this point, I'm a big Michael Schenker fan, huge Michael Schenker fan. 
I understand. He's one of my heroes. Yeah, yeah. My, my, ever since. Mine too. And so I was, I think I was 18 then. Um, so five years had passed and I'd obviously progressed a lot. And so I get the phone call from Filmog uh, and basically says, we, we've heard about you and we're doing a concert. Would you be interested in, in playing with the band? And I was like, of course. Um, and he goes, okay, great. Well, come to this location and uh, we'll do a few days rehearsal and then we will um, we'll do a concert. So they said they, they gave me a awesome. <laughs> they gave me a list of songs. There was about 20 songs on the list. I knew about 14 of them because they were, you know, all the classics. And so we went out to this place in East London. It was a big rehearsal studio, and it's where Judas Priest and Deep Purple used to do all their okay. production rehearsals. So it was huge. It was like an aircraft hangar. <laughs> and and um, initially it was just me, the bass player and the drummer. And so we were going through all of the songs just to make sure I knew all of them. And then Phil Mogg turned up about three or four hours later. And, and so we went in and the first, he, we got on there and the first thing he said to me was, well, what do you want to play? Um, and I went, well, let's start with Lights Out. And so the first song I played with UFO was Lights Out. And, and I'd worked with many singers beforehand but and only when I stood next to Phil Mogg and heard him singing yeah. I, I suddenly realized I've not worked with any singers before this this is a singer yeah and it's very hard for me to put into words the feeling you get when you're standing three feet away from one of your heroes and he's singing one of your favorite songs and <laughs> and it's just like it's a level of euphoria that is indescribable yeah and, and that this was a huge turning point for me because i suddenly realized what it actually took to to be like of that level so we did the show and it generated a lot of uh, media exposure you know my name got even more known and then i got approached by rod smallwood who manages iron maiden to, uh, he wanted to be my manager and so then we okay. were out putting together um, my, my first real band was Jagged Edge. And even though there'd been many lineups of Jagged Edge prior to me playing with UFO, it was only after UFO that it became very serious. And then we started, um, well, I got the first lineup together and we went on tour with Ozzy Osbourne and we supported yeah. Ozzy Osbourne on the No Rest for the Wicked tour. Um, and that fell apart. And then we. Um, sorry, may I surely interrupt you? Uh, sure. You said um, this tour, Rest for the Wicked. You, you've played in Germany then as well. No, no. It's, what happened was, and it's a long story. So, we, at this time, we're managed by two people. We're managed by Rod Smallwood, and we're managed by a guy called Joe Brown, who owns Tasco. And he was the person who owned the rehearsal studio that UFO. Uh, rehearsed that so okay. it, there was a lot of connections going on and and so the way that Jagged Edge got the tour with Ozzy Osbourne is that Tasco promised Sharon Osbourne all the PA and lights for free because that's what Tasco did they provided PA and lights okay so we get get onto the support tour and we're off on tour and with it's about a 25 day tour of the UK and then it becomes very clear that the person who owns Tasco, his intention is that if we was to get a record deal, because now at this point record companies are getting interested, if yeah. we were to get a record deal, he was going to take the money for the PA and lights of the Ozzy Osbourne tour and make us pay for it. And, and Rod Smallwood, the other manager who managed Iron Maiden, just went, no, 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 no. That's not going to happen. And, and he, Rod, Rod Smallwood came to me and said, you've got a decision. You can either come with me or you can stick with Joe Brown because I can't work with him like that because that's not how I do business. And if you want to stay with him, then that's your choice. So obviously we decided to go with Rod Smallwood. And as a result of that, Joe Brown, who owned Tasco, impounded all of our equipment 
kicked us off of the Ozzy Osbourne tour. Um, and so we only did about three quarters of the tour. And we went through, you know, a huge battle to get our equipment back. Equipment back. But then obviously we, we stuck with Rod Smallwood then and he became the sole manager of Jagged Edge. And we ended up signing a record deal to um, uh, Polydor. I was just asking because in Germany, I was on that tour. I saw Ozzy Osbourne in Munich on that tour. And that's was, that was why I'm asking because I can't sense back um, who was the supporting band, who was the, the opener. Uh, I mean, at that time, uh, the opener got, I think, 30 minutes max. Yeah. Um, got a, it might, this was the old times, you know, a bad sound, a bad light. So you were more or less just that uh, the stage is occupied. <laughs> um, so the problem is it was very hard. I, I felt sorry and felt sad for the, for the supporting bands because uh, they had not really the, uh, the right uh, circumstances to show what they, what they have, what they, what they can do and what they, what they, what they did, yeah. The horror, story, present them the horror the right stories way. I could tell you about being a support band, we could have a show just dedicated. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I'm pretty sure about that. So that so was, then, you know, and so yeah. then, so then we had the that was, that was the first lineup of Jagged Edge. So, but the lineup that supported Ozzy Osbourne, by the end of the tour, it became apparent that people were were not taking it seriously, and they were doing things with their body, which basically meant that the shows were not as good as they should be, and and my dedication to music was so strong. That I found this unacceptable. And then I spoke to Rod and I said, this lineup isn't the lineup. Um, and, and we went about putting together a new lineup. Then we got contacted by Polydor, contacted by Polydor Records, and they said, we have this singer called Mattia Fonsetti, and we know that you have this guitar player, Mike Gray, and what we would like you to do is if you two guys get together and it works, we will give you a record deal. So Matty flew over to, from Sweden, because he's Swedish, and they put us together for one day. And we did a day of, um, I had this song, we went into a recording studio, we recorded the song on a weekend, which was produced by Chris Tangredis, um, um, who's sadly passed now, but he produced bands like Halloween and Judas Priest. Yeah. He produced Painkiller and various other bits and pieces. We did the demo. And on Monday morning, we got a record deal. Um, and we'd only spent one day with each other. So we got the record deal. Oh. And then we had the, you know, then we had to get together and write a whole album. Um, and that's how Jagged Edge came about. And um, we initially did um, a five track mini album, which was called Trouble. And it had five songs on it. One of it was Good, Good, Good Golly Miss Molly, which was a Little Richard's uh, song. Yeah. Um, that did quite well. We went out on tour with bands like Thunder and um, Bruce Dickinson, Vixen, Dan Reed Project. And then we went in and recorded our big album with Jeff Glicksman, who was the producer, who done, you know, originally he was a member of Kansas. He produced the Kansas albums and Georgia Satellites and you know, a whole bunch of stuff. And then we went out and and we tried to, we toured with David Lee Roth. Uh, we toured with Bruce Dickinson all around Europe. But, you know, it, it fell apart eventually because uh, the singer and I didn't really get on. We had very, okay. very different views of, of where the band should go. But I guess it was kind of to be expected when you consider how we got together, you know? Yeah we were just kind of thrown together and said, right, now make it work, you know? Yeah, without knowing each other, without yeah. knowing um, the mindset, uh, the understanding of, uh, like you said, which direction to go and, and which, which style you prefer and things like that. So yeah, exactly. uh, and you and have it, to get it, to know it, each other uh, when you should uh, be ready. That's yeah. the point. So um, Yeah, there was none of that kind of getting together, knowing each other's influences and none of that. It was just kind of like, you're a great singer, he's a guitar player, now make it work. And yeah. it, was, it was destined to fail, but of course, there's a couple of songs, like a song called You Don't Love Me, which was the first single off of that. It's, it's a song that's still played on the radio now. 
you know so out of that um you know even though the band probably only existed for maybe 18 months to two years okay. uh, one classic track came out of it which is still played today on the radio so you know a little, little bit of rock history was made from that band that's i think that's um a point that not many uh, musicians reach everyone wants to achieve it um, to have one song or one one thing, like you say, that survives tens of years yeah. and is still popular, still, uh, and people still like it. So yeah. that's that's really, uh, I think it's a huge price. We made our, that's our, for me, it's always about the songs. You know, everything is always about the songs. I'm, I've, always, I've always been the songwriter in all of the bands that I've been involved in, you know. So my, my, my life's ambition or my life's work is to try and contribute to this wonderful thing called rock music, you know, and, and I've dedicated my life to try and to come up with some songs that people will still want to listen to years later. Okay, so then um, if my research was right, out of um, some members from uh, Jagged Edge, um, you, you found it then, Skin? Yeah, so it became very apparent that Jagged Edge was going to collapse uh, because the, the friction between myself and the singer was, it was just silly things. It was like, for instance, when we were recording the first album, when we went to have it mixed, they, the record company flew myself and the singer over to Los Angeles and have it mixed by Paul Lani. And the, we did one song and then the singer said, okay, well, I'm going back to England now. And it was like, but we're here to mix the whole <laughs> album. Why, why, yeah. why are you leaving? And it was like, because I want to see my girlfriend. And it was just kind of like, dude, we've just spent like a year writing this album, recording this album, and you're just going back to England now because you want to be with your girlfriend. Is it more important than this album? You know, so my mindset was nothing is more important than this album. Um, and, so and you put a lot of effort on it. I mean, you, you talk about a year yeah. of... Um, songwriting, um, I think uh, several trials, you don't sit down. Sometimes you, I think you sit down and, and just write a song because it's, uh, it's floating. Um, but I think if you have to, um, it's harder. Yeah, so for, for me, the, the making of music is the, the most important thing in my life. So it was just something I didn't quite understand and it was just a different mindset. So it became very obvious that this, this project wasn't going to be a long-term thing. Yeah. So I was already thinking about who was going to be the next singer um, that I worked with. And the way that it came about with Neville McDonald, who was the singer of Skin, I was in a club called the, Mar um, the St. Moritz, which was across the road from the old Marquee Club. And it was basically everyone who played in the Marquee would go to the St. Moritz. Just across the street. <laughs> afterwards. And, you know, and this is all the musicians used to hang out there. And there was a little stage in there. And so one night I got up and I'm playing with, with uh, some bunch of musicians. And then someone says, oh, this guy's going to sing. And so he got up onto the stage and we started playing um, rock and roll by Led Zeppelin. And as soon as he opened yeah. his mouth, I was like, oh, my God. It's like, this is this is this voice is unbelievable. Um, yeah. And this was actually prior to Jagged Edge. This was prior to Matty Alfonsetti. So in my head, okay. I'm thinking that Neville McDonald is going to be the next singer I'm working with. But then the, then we got approached by the record label. And so Matty yeah. became the person. But I never forgot Neville McDonald. So anyway, we're in this nightclub playing this song. And in my head, I'm just thinking, my God, this is one of the greatest voices I've, I've ever heard. And then all of a sudden, halfway through the song, a big guy walks up to the stage and says, if you're going to play my father's songs, you're going to have to play them right. And he took the drumsticks out of the drummer's hands and it was Jason Bonham. Wow. And so we're on this stage. There's me on guitar, there's Neville vocal and there's Jason Bonham. And then we play um, rock awesome. and roll and then we play a whole lot of love. And it was just kind of like, yeah. oh my God, this is, this is amazing. But this is something I never forgot. So as soon as Jagged Edge broke down, I then contacted Neville McDonald and said, 
okay, how do you feel about making this work? And, yeah. and we got together and, and this worked very, very well. You know, it was, we wrote songs very easily and, you know, songs like Look But Don't Touch, uh, songs which are still played and listened to now, these were written like within the first 10 days of knowing each other. And so, so how did, uh, sorry, how did, how did it work uh, with the songwriting? Um, you are, you're doing the riffs, uh, the, the, the melody, the harmonies, whatever, and uh, the singer writes the, the lyrics, or do you do the whole package, or, um, or is, it, is it a mix of everything? Sometimes teamwork, sometimes just you? I mean, my, my uh, role as songwriter has very much changed over the years. When we were, um, when I was writing for Jagged Edge with Matty, what I would tend to do is come up with the riff and then I would sort of have an idea of what the melody should be. And then Matty wrote the lyrics and he also contributed to the melody. Now, yeah. one, one of the things, so that was very much kind of like uh, a team, 50-50. Yeah. And then, but because I, within Jagged Edge, I didn't like the lyrics that Matty was writing because um, that was just my own personal opinion. It was yeah. not what I deemed as, as good enough. And so then I, when I got into Skin, I then started to write the lyrics as well. And so I was writing, like most of the Skin songs are written by me. Um, and some of, the, some of them are written by me and Neville, but Neville's contribution was mainly some of the lyrics. For, yeah. And then as, as Skin went on, then I started to write everything because I wrote um, songs like Tower of Strength and Money and they became the hits. So it just became obvious that I was the songwriter. Um, and then that became the big changing point where I, I wrote all of the songs. Um, and then when we formed, I mean, jumping down the line, now I just yeah. write by myself. You know, I, I tend to... Uh, I mean, I'm singing the songs now as well. So it, it okay. it's, it's even more personal to me now than ever before. Um, yeah, songwriting is kind of like why I play music more than, okay. any, more than anything else. It's, it's, um, it's the reason why I don't play in other people's bands is because the writing of my own music is so important to me that I, yeah. I don't like to um, deviate that energy or direct my energy elsewhere. Yeah, and I suppose uh, once you um, you did it and it worked and it worked well and it worked very well, um, it's I think it's not so easy then to step back and um, discuss maybe harmonies or special sections with three other people um, because you you have on your mind how you want to sound the song, how you want to hear the song, how it should look like, the structure, whatever. I mean, and then having a long discussion with three other people Maybe I mean, I mean, to be fair, within Skin, you know, there's always been a lot of musicians can be full of a lot of conflict. You know, they're very emotional people, you know, so their their logical thinking sometimes is a bit suspect. Yeah. You know, it's, it's very much they're driven by emotional needs. You know, that's a you know, when you get into the world of logical thinking and emotional thinking, musicians tend to be emotional. Um, you know, most of my clients are in the in the financial sector and they just kind of think logically and emotion doesn't come into their thought process. Yeah. This is something that I learned in my 52 years of living. But at the time, but within Skin, to their credit, uh, the other band members just let me run it musically. They didn't, okay. they, there wasn't too much conflict within the band. There was a lot of conflict with, in Jagged Edge, but within skin, there wasn't uh, too much conflict, you know. Well, that's uh, there's always two sides. I mean, conflicts and, and discussions can lead to a badass result or take the other direction. Yeah, ab absolutely. You know, um, but, but I was very fortunate in skin. You know, things went quite smoothly. Then when skin broke up and then we reformed years later, I then created another band called Red, White and Blues. And that was with Matti Alfonsetti again. So the okay. song from Jagged Edge and I worked, you know, maybe 20 years later. I don't know if you've heard Red, White and Blues. but we yeah, I heard through all the things you did. 
so that's yeah, that couple of days. <laughs> so that album came together, and and Matty and I always wrote very well, very easily. Um, we had differences of opinion lyrically, but on Red, White, and Blues, I wrote all of the lyrics. So, okay. so from that point of view, I sort of took over that side of it. So there wasn't conflict. The only thing that broke the band up again was work work ethic. I'm a workaholic um, and live and breathe music 365 days a year. Okay. Uh, and and <clears throat> and not so for Matty. And that was the thing that broke the band up. Yeah, I mean, uh, the point is, I think if it should work and if it has to work for long term, you have to be on the same page and you have to have the same mindset and, and understanding. I mean, I don't judge if uh, what's right or what's wrong because um, I don't have the insight and that's everyone's own uh, responsibility and its own decision. Yeah. But the point is, if it doesn't match and if it doesn't work, um, I think it's just stressing up more or less. Um, and yeah, I mean, it can't I mean, work for a long time. I always see uh, a band... Like a, like a football team. I don't know if you're into sports. Yeah. You know, but they have the Seahawks. Huh? Yeah. I support the Seattle Seahawks. Right. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm a big, big sportsman. You know, I'm a martial artist and I've played sports all of my life. And, you know, when you look at successful teams, you know, like the Manchester United that had Roy Keane and Ronaldo, Alex Ferguson, you know, and then you look at the Real Madrids, you know, and there's a mindset. That runs through a whole team yeah and if one person doesn't have that mindset they become a liability to the team you know yeah. and that's the same thing with a band unless you've got four people five people three people six people all thinking the same way you will have a weakness within the band at some point if you're four drug addicts at least you're all four drug addicts together you know, but if you want four or five people that are very, very driven, one of the things that was another big turning point in my life was when I worked with Bruce Dickinson for My Maiden. Um, and I played on, I recorded two albums with him. And um, I went to Los Angeles and worked with him on an album with Keith Olsen. And then I did another album with him with Chris Tangredis. And working with Bruce made me realize how committed you have to be to be a, a superstar, you know, and Bruce has been a superstar for four decades, you know, one of the most, absolutely, one of the most successful, prolific, consistent superstars in rock music, one of the greatest singers. And I got to work with him probably for about six months in, in total. And I saw that level of commitment which never went below 10. It was always on 10, whether it be rehearsal, whether it be in the recording studio, whether it was giving an interview, it was always on 10. And it was kind of like, that's what, you, that's what you've got to be like. And if you've ever met Steve Harris, he's also on yeah. 10 all the time. And if you meet Rod Smallwood, this is a man who's on 11 all of the time. <laughs> You know, ferocious individuals. And so when you look at Iron Maiden, it's a team of very, very driven and committed human beings. And I always saw music as the same way. You have to make a team. And you have to make sure that your team is on the same mindset as you. And if they're not, they're not the right ones. Uh, absolutely. I, I fully agree. I mean, if I think about, like you mentioned, Bruce Dickinson um, and his mindset and his professional work and his being focused on uh on the goal um i saw iron maiden for the first time in 1981 mm -hmm. in germany it was a two days festival an in indoor festival um i saw crocus there it was with quiet rides scorpions you were judas at that priest. concert yeah that's one of the greatest concerts judas priest def leopard yeah that's, that's two days in, in dortmund there i've been there that's that's possibly the greatest festival of all time I've in seen back, that so many times. Um, in my back, um, I have, I call it my walls of fame with all my tickets. I kept everything, guitar picks, what I catch, and drumsticks and things like that. Um, and uh, there's this ticket from uh, this festival. I mean, this, this, this festival is legendary. This is like, you know, it's, it's legendary. It's like and if you think gone. about, and if you think about it, you had five bands per day, and the day, daily ticket was 25 euros. Oh, my God. 
That's amazing that you went to that. Amazing, incredible. I mentioned this. Um, I mentioned this uh, um, a couple of times. My first concert was in 1979 for eight euros, and that was the Scorpions. Oh my gosh! Who was and playing? Three weeks later. Sorry. Who was the guitar player? Um, it was shortly before um, Michael Schenker left again, because so they started got- the Love Drive tour with Michael Schenker. And for that reason, I bought the ticket as well. So I was so excited to get to that gig. <clears throat> and it was, I think it was the first gig on that tour when they played with Matthias Jobs. Oh, wow. That's <laughs> left eye tour. So one of my favorite guitar players. Um, and three months later, around two and, a, two and a half months later, I saw ACDC on the Highway to Hell tour with Bon Scott. I was one of the lucky guys in this world who saw this man on stage and that was awesome. Wow. These are the things that stick deep in my head. Oh, yeah. um, I mean, I can even remember three different things when my wife uh, t- uh, sends me out to buy something. I cannot imagine three different things, but things like that 40 years ago, you never forget. These are moments that, I and that's what music does. That's yeah. the point. That's what music does. You, you, either, you either understand it or you don't. So I understand everything you're saying. Awesome. Yeah, it was, was a great time, to be honest. So... Um, this is more or less your when you played um, with other bands then you released a instrumental album yeah I mean yeah it was uh, I listened through it as well Um, mainly logically uh, guitar focused and it's an awesome uh, it's an awesome album to be honest thank you I mean I'm a I'm a guitar fan I never played any instrument so I have big respect uh, for everyone who's playing at least flute or something. <laughs> um, so uh, I was always fascinated by guitar players like Joe Satriani, for example. I have uh, his instrumental albums also badass, uh, but I like their album very well. So how did the idea come up to make a strict um, guitar well, album? Guitar if focused you, album, instrumental. If you follow the, the history of my career, there's always been problems with singers, whether it be the singer of Jagged Edge. When Skin reformed in 2008 or 2009, we played Download Festival. And then I formed, and the singer from Skin, it was initially just meant to be one show. It was just meant to be reformed for Download. Okay. Say thank you, and then good night. But this all went on for nearly two years. We went back on tour with Little Angels, We recorded two albums. Um, We did our own headline tours. We played download again. It just seemed to be growing. Um, And, but then the singer from Skin said, I can't do this anymore because I have my other life. I'm a school teacher. I just can't. Oh, okay. I can't give the commitment. So that's when Red, White and Blues was formed. So for a period of time, there was Skin out on tour recording albums. There was Red, White and Blues out on tour. We supported Chicken Foot. We supported Lina Skinnerd. We supported White Snake. Yeah, so awesome. I, I'm in two bands doing these big shows. We also played Download. And then Red, White and Blues were asked to support ZZ Top. Um, two, two shows, massive shows. And I was like, amazing, fantastic. And I said to the singer from Red, White and Blues, we're going we're gonna to support ZZ Top. He said, I, I can't do it. I was like, what? What do you mean you can't do it? He goes, oh, I have, I have uh, commitments at home and, you know, they, I've got problems at home. Um, and I was like, oh, man, you know, okay, well, we can't do it then. But we were also due to play Download <laughs> the same year that Skin was meant to play Download. So... Red, White and Blues were meant to be playing on the Saturday and then Skin were meant to be playing on the Sunday. And so I was very disappointed that we wouldn't be playing with ZZ Top. But I always thought that we would still be playing a download. And then the singer from Red, White and Blues and said, I can't do download either. And it was like, you've got to be kidding me. You can't, you're not going to play download. What could be more important than not playing download? Yeah. But he said, no, he can't do it. It turned out he was recording a solo album, but that's, that's, that's by the bar. So then I asked the singer from Skin, can you stand in 
for the singer of Red, White and Blues. It's only for 30 minutes. It's six songs. Thinking that he would instantly say yes, no problem. Um, but he didn't say yes, he said no. And as a result of it, he then quit Skin. So I'm meant, I'm meant to be playing Download with Red, White and Blues on the Saturday, and I'm meant to be playing, playing Download with Skin on the Sunday. Both singers decided that they didn't want to do it yeah. for whatever reasons. And so I just put my guitars down and went, I've had enough. If, if you guys are going to make dumb, stupid decisions about not doing this and not doing that, yeah. not realizing that you are being given one of the greatest privileges in your life to play on the same stage as our heroes. If you're that yeah. dumb and selfish, I'm having nothing to do with it. So I put my guitar down for, for a few years and I just said, I can't do this anymore. Um, and then the call of- So then you, um, I didn't understand that, you, you did a few years break, a few yeah. years? Yeah, it, it was, wow. that was in, I think that happened in 2012. And then in 2016, I, the call of music, I didn't pick my guitars up. Guitars no. stayed down. I felt so betrayed by these people that I just, I'd had enough. Um, but then the guitar started to call to me. And then one day someone, I was on Facebook and someone said, if you ever need a drummer, I'd be happy to come up and, and play. And so then I picked up my guitar and I started to play guitar um, and I was just, and I couldn't play, you know, I hadn't played for many years and I just started to practice, you know, all the things I used yeah. to, and these little instrumental things just started to materialize. And when I started playing guitar, it was, it was because I was influenced by people like Randy Rhodes and Michael Schenker yeah, and Van awesome. Halen. And they would have these instrumental songs like Hot Lost Horizons, or they would, you know, within songs, there would be these huge pieces like Mr. Crowley. And they'd, yeah. And so I just started playing guitar again, inspired by the things that initially got me into playing guitar in the first place. Back to the roots. Yeah, I didn't want to work with a singer. I just, I just saw no way. I'm not, I'm not having, I'm not dealing with that emotional dilemma and and um all the emotional stuff that comes with with singers and i just constructed all of this music and i was very very happy just playing guitar and and that's how the shades of gray album came about yeah and then i wrote one song at the end where i thought well this one actually needs a singer and it was a song called take me home and then i got um lorraine crosby who's a very good singer she sang on uh, the meatloaf song I would do anything for love, but I wouldn't yeah. do that. And so she, she sung the vocal to take me home. And then that got me back into writing songs again. But my instrumental album came about purely because I just did not want to be in the same room as a singer. Um, and, then, and, then, and then a whole bunch of other things happened and that's how Shades of Grey came about. So um, Shades of Grey is now um, a solo project. For you so yeah. you do um in the in the truest sense of the word so that means you do everything on your own i do everything but the drums okay i play the bass guitar i play all the guitars i do all the vocals i write all of the songs and this came about because i was the instrumental album came out and i was invited by download to play a download they said we really like the album um, would you like to play? And it was like, well, what do you want me to play? Do you want me to play the instrumental album or do you want me to play songs from my back catalogue? And they were yeah. like, we're happy for you to do whatever you want. You know, so we just, cool. we, just want, we just want you to play. So then I thought, wow, I, well, I've got all of these songs, you know, I've got the Jagged Edge songs. I've got the Red, White and Blue songs. I've got the Skin songs. I've got my new songs. And so it was, okay, let's, let's get a singer. Um, and so I got a singer from a band called Blackwater Conspiracy, Phil Connolly. And we did two days of rehearsal and playing like um, a mixture of all of the bands that I've been in before. And then that got me into like, okay, I can actually go out on tour just playing songs from my back catalogue. And people, yeah. 
people will come and people will like it. Um, and so then that would then became the Mike Gray touring band. Um, and then I came across another singer and I spent a year writing songs for them. And I, I made four videos for them and I was producing it. And exactly the same thing happened where like halfway through the project, they went, oh, we don't want, I don't want to do this anymore. And I was like, I just don't believe it. And I'd even got them a slot, a download. They played it download. And in my head, I'm just like, do you know what? I'm just going to do it myself. I cannot be asked with dealing with these prima donna singers anymore. I'll, I'll just do it myself. And so I, I think did. This is, must be like someone stepping a, a knife in your back. I mean, every time. You, every time. You, you put again effort and work. You have your ideas and you... You know what you want to do and how to do it and then they just <laughs> yeah leave you alone that's wow <laughs> so so what i did i did one song which was a song called i get up and and i recorded it uh, in my in my studio which was where i am now um i made a little video for it and i even wore makeup in it and dressed up in it so people no one would know it was me and i just did it because i just wanted to show that I was capable of doing it myself without having to help anyone, without yeah. having to have a singer, just that I could make music myself. And I released it and to my huge surprise, it got playlisted on Planet Rock, which is a big radio station in the UK. Yeah. And it got playlisted and played every day. Um, and all of a sudden cool. like, oh wow, people will listen to this. I don't need a singer. I just never dreamt that one of the song that I would sing would be played on the radio. I'd always assumed that someone else would be singing them. And so that one song was the catalyst to Shades of Grey. And now I'm on song nine. It's a very unusual project because what I do is record one song and then I release it and then the next one and then they release it. And so once I get to 10, it will be released as an album and I'm on song nine right now. And um, we've been doing pre-orders through my website and we've, we've done over 600 pre-orders and that's financed the making of the videos and, and everything that's gone with it. And it's the first time where I feel completely liberated, where I, I'm not reliant upon anyone else to stop me making music. Um, and you're not dependent, that's the point. Yeah. Um, and so it's been a big journey for me. Uh, but it uh, must be a good feeling as well, I think. Yeah, yeah, it's very having exactly. having full control, um, and it maybe for the first time works like you think it should work. Yeah, without anything left or right or any deviations or something. You know, I I know that I'll sing a vocal at midnight. I know that I'll still be editing vocals at three o'clock in the morning. I know that I'll wake <laughs> wake up and I'll be writing lyrics. It takes longer because you have to do everything to a certain standard. You know, so when I'm doing vocals, sometimes it takes a couple of weeks to get all the backing vocals together. Yeah. And then you think, oh, now I've got to play a guitar solo and I haven't played guitar for a few weeks. And then it's like, oh, no, now I've got to play bass. And, you know, so you have to, you keep going back to get up to the standard of everything else. So it makes the project a little bit longer, but ultimately more satisfying. I think so, because what I, what I can imagine, I mean, I don't know, I'm not a musician, I'm just a fan. But um, if you, um, I mean, there are singers like uh, I saw John Farnham from the Little River Band a couple of times live because this guy has a voice. I mean, he's two, meter, two meters tall. He has a breast like, I don't know, uh, that can, could a family live in. So you, you hear where the sound comes from. Yeah. And I don't know if you know the song um, Touch of Paradise. No. Um, it's on his first album, I think. Uh, I'll research it. And it's... Um, It's a, a like a power ballad, but it's very um, it's very stressful for the voice, and you have to have a range, and you have to have vocal skills and the technique and stuff. Yeah. And he sang this song at the two hours concert as an additional song, as the last song. Wow! And he hit every tune from down in the basement up to the rooftop. Amazing! Awesome! Amazing! And if you look at such a person and he didn't even sweat, he, he wasn't exhausted, he was, he stood like a, like a stone, that was 
wow, these are awesome moments. I mean, it, uh, I was so impressed when I saw him for the first time after two hours. Never expected this song because I, I liked the album and I was always, uh, I liked him as a singer as, uh, in general. But yeah, there's a lot of things. So I think the, the, to adjust your voice or your range, um, what, what you can do with your voice to the music or vice versa, I think. Uh, this yeah. is also the, the challenge then. Yeah. Also, to start um, being clear about uh, your voice skills and then start the, the song along, writing along with, with it. Yeah, I mean, this, this is, I mean, I've, I've been very lucky that I've worked with some of the greatest singers in the world. And, and even though, I, you know, we've had, I've had a lot of conflict with singers over the, in, in my years, I also recognize that they are some of the greatest singers in the world. You know, singers like Matty Alfonsetti and, and Bruce Dickinson and, and Neville McDonald, they are phenomenal, incredible singers. And so when I'm writing for them, I know what they can do. And so I write specifically for their voice. Um, with my own particular voice, it was, it was a new, new thing for me. And I, was, I had to discover what I could and couldn't do. And so over the course of the year, my like the first song that I wrote, I Get Up, is, is a relatively simple song, you know, and now as the year is going on, as my voice is developing, the songs are becoming a little bit more elaborate and I'm learning to push myself and, and doing things that I never ever dreamt that I would be able to do. But that's because I've been singing now for a whole year, you know, yeah. and, you know, and, and you sort of build up those skills. And, and a frequent pace. I mean, your, your voice gets used to it, your voice gets... Uh, yeah. Uh, is is more able to deal with stress. Yeah, uh, I think the distance also the longer you can sing from day to day, so or from uh, over a longer period. So maybe you start uh, before the throat is starting hurting after thirty minutes. Maybe you step up with this as well because yeah. I think it's very um, it, it's not easy to sing along for two hours live on stage. Um, um, really have big respect for um, for every singer. Yeah, I mean, you're right. When I, when I started, I was only able to sing for maybe like 45 minutes and then you could feel, oh, and then like the next day it would be sore. But now yeah. I can sing every day for about two hours, you know, and sometimes I have a day off in between, but there's always things to do. But your, your, your stamina increases. Yeah. And that's definitely something that I've learned over the course of the year. It's been a huge learning curve for me. It's almost like one of the most important stages of my musical development. Yeah, and and uh, I was talking to the singer from Dead Daisies. I, I had a meet and greet ticket when they were here two years ago, I think, in Germany. Also, one of, one of the last concerts I've been. And I was I was asking John Corabi because the gig where I was, where I had the meet and greet, was I think they had another two shows and they were done with a ten months world tour. Wow. So. I was asking him, I mean, um, again, they had two shows left, including or excluding the show where I was. And I was asking, how, how do you deal with that? I mean, you are the singer. That means you are the front man. It's not just only singing, which is hard enough. You also, you are the voice to the audience. You, you start to build up a, a relationship with the audience. I mean, you talk more or less the whole time. And in between, you talk uh, to the songs or you do make some fun uh, with some guys in the audience anyways. Uh, you are permanently, your voice is permanently um, stressed. And therefore, how do you do it? And he said, well, off stage, shut up. I mean, but this, is a, very, this is a very important point because, you know, when you're, you know, when you're a kid and you're dreaming of being a musician and, and you don't really understand that to be a successful musician, it means that you have to go on tour for year, you know, months and months and months yeah. and deliver at the same standard as a professional footballer. You know, someone like Ronaldo or Messi, every time they walk, walk onto the pitch, the fans expect them to score. Yeah. They expect them to win the game, you know, and, and the true greats. And without doubt, the, the only person I've, I mean, I've worked with Roger Daltrey as well, but without doubt, Bruce Dickinson is the person who I would say, I've, I've worked with one of the, not only one of the greatest singers in the world, but he kept it going for four decades. It's like, this is like beyond any sportsman. He stayed yeah. at the top through this whole time. And then you realize it's because it's discipline. It's constant discipline. 
Neville MacDonald was extremely disciplined. He would never speak in the day. He would start to do his warm-ups around five o'clock, six o'clock, preparing for the show. And then after the show, he wouldn't speak. And we would be doing five or six shows a week. And we, this is what we would do. Um, which is and this confirms what John, uh, John Gravy said to me. I mean, same thing. Shut yeah. up, drinking tea, and um, no, nothing with sex, drugs, and rock and roll, because I don't think that you could do at least two shows in a row. Exactly. It's, it's so they have to be um, they have to be in a good condition uh, physically, definitely. And I mean, a ten months tour or twelve months tour, it's it's awesome. Yeah. I saw Def Leppard in Berlin and in Munich in between three days. So I went first to Berlin just two years ago with with they were there with Europe, um, and two days later I saw them in Munich in the Olympic Stadium. Uh, they did a double headliner gig with Bon Jovi, and they were headlining the show in Berlin. Again, just only two days in between. And Joe Elliott, I mean, I'm a diehard Def Leppard fan, a fan to be honest, <laughs> but uh, Joe Elliott, since 40 years, it's yeah. amazing. But like and they every, are smart. In every walk of life, it's going to be the people that are most disciplined. You know, there's lots of people who have a little bit of success, but sustained success is a completely different thing. You know, to make a great album, to do a great tour, to make another great album. And that cycle, this, this goes beyond musical talent. This is, this is about inner strength and discipline. And um, yeah. any artist that has a 10-year career, I mean, then we start talking about the Def Leppards and the Scorpions, you know, bands that just have been going for 40, 50 years. You know, this is not done... These are the greatest achievements. It's the greatest musical achievements. Um, I think so. And again, they have to, as a, especially as a singer, you have to take care. I, knew, I know a few singers. I talked to a few singers and they more or less all stay the same. Yeah. Um, you have to be careful. Um, you know, you have to protect your throat. Definitely. Uh, be careful not st standing in front of the open window when you're wet or something like that. You know, just yeah. basic rules. But uh, take care of yourself. And... Yeah. Have in mind that uh, your instrument is the voice, and it's hard enough. So I have respect for for every one of them, especially. Yeah. Um, I mean, shows with two two and a half hours in a row. Um, I mean, like Def Leppard did a, did a two, um, two hour show. I mean, they have a bunch of albums. They have I don't know how many songs they could play uh, one night in a row. But I mean, um, on top of this, you have a response. You know, we're music lovers. I can tell from the way you talk is that we're passionate about music. And if you go, you may only get to see one of your favorite bands once in your entire life, you know? So imagine, you know, you've waited 10 years to see your favorite band and you've got all of this emotional attachment. You're going to the concert, you owe it to the fans to yeah. give it, to give them what, they're, what they want, to get their dreams, their emotional attachment. You know, I couldn't imagine going out on the stage and giving 50% or 60% because it would just be disrespectful to the people that have in emotionally invested in your songs. And that's what songs yeah. are. They're an emotional investment. You know, it's like when, when I go and see um, the Scorpions, when they play Dynamite, to me, this is, you know, something I was listening to when I was, you know, 14 years of age, trying to play it. I want Matthias Jabs to do that start of the solo exactly like it is. It's, you know, this, yeah. this is how we are about music. You want it to be even greater than the record, you know, and that's what live music is. It actually gives you the opportunity to make it better than the album because now you get the emotional connection. You see it. You see the, the, the art, you see the artist and the, the artist sees the fans. It takes it to another level. You know, I'll, Absolutely. I'll never forget standing next to Phil Mogg and, and playing Lights Out because I'm standing next to the guy and he, he sings the opening line and this, this electricity shoots through your body. And as a result of it, you want to play as well as he's singing. And there's this, yeah. you know, and then you feed off the audience and, and you're all sort of coming up together. You know, it's the audience as much as the band that makes it special. It's, it's, it's both. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a huge package. Uh, yeah. it's, 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 a, it's the whole thing. So, so if you... It's not if, only the artist, um, 
on stage and it's not only the audience it has to work it, it there has to be a relationship there has to be energy and it has to work together and that makes a good show that's it Both and, and, parties. and and the thing is it's like if you're on stage you're only and you're only giving 50 percent don't expect the audience to give you a hundred percent because they're only going to give you back what you give them you know, and if you give them 100%, they give 100%, and then together you come to something, yeah. you've done something together. It wasn't the artist. It wasn't, it was, it was that unity. It's the, Absolutely. it's the special thing about music, you know? And it's also professionality. Yeah. The, the understanding of your job. Uh, I once saw Lance Keltner, I don't know if you know him, he's a guitar player from Canada. Um, it was, uh, I think, about 20 years ago, and he was playing in a small club uh, near of my hometown, and uh, the ticket sales were awful. So we were in total, in including the, the waitresses, about 25 people. Mm -hmm. And he went up to stage, um, he looked uh, through the curtain, and he went back. So I was expecting, to be honest, that he uh, goes on stage, maybe gives us 45 minutes, and then leaves, because for 25 people. This guy did a full-blown two-hours show, he, he really set the stage on fire for 25 people. And we had a bunch of fun. We had, uh, it was a great atmosphere and it was just awesome. And this was, this guy was professional. Yeah. Because the point is if just only one person is in, this person bought a ticket. And I, I remember you can we, expect a good show. We were playing, it was Skin. And at that time we weren't called Skin, but we'd worked with, we were working with Bruce Dickinson. And we did, um, in the UK, there's a thing called Comic Relief. And every year, an artist does a song for Comic Relief and it becomes a big hit. And, and in that particular year, Bruce Dickinson was doing it. And he did um, an Alice Cooper song called Elected. And yes. Skin was the backing band. And so we recorded the song with Chris Tangredis and Bruce did the vocal and it became a hit in the UK. And, and Skin were playing some shows and then Bruce said, well, why don't I come up and get up on stage with you in Norwich and we'll play. Cool. And it was being recorded by the BBC. Um, so it had a wide audience. It's the reason why Bruce wanted to do it because it was being done at the same time as the single release. So it would have generated a lot of yeah. um, exposure. And, but there was only about 600 people in the venue even though it was called Sound City. Um, and at that time, Iron Maiden were on like Seventh Son of a Seventh Son. They were, they were huge. They were, yeah. you know, like one of the biggest bands in the world. Absolutely. And Bruce said, well, I'll, you play your set and then I'll get up and, and I'll do Elected on the Encore. You know, and he hit the stage like a tornado, you know. And, you know, we thought we were doing great and the audience were liking us and everything <laughs> yeah. was good. But the, when he came on stage and you saw the audience, the audience didn't know that he was going to get up. And the audience was just like, <gasps> you know, it's like Bruce Dickinson <laughs> just walked on stage. And the intensity that comes from him bleeds onto the audience, which bleeds onto us. And all of a sudden, it was like, my God, this is like something unreal. And you can feel it, I think. Yeah. yeah. You powerful. can feel the energy. Powerful, you know. Pure energy. The magic of awesome. music. Yeah, and I think uh, there's, that brings me to uh, the current situation a little bit. Um, there's no, no band can do any show. I think it's the hardest time for a musician because, I mean, songwriting is one part of it, arranging it, mixing it, producing it. But then when you have something new, you want on, to go on stage and, and uh, perform and, and show the people what you've done, your work and stuff. So yeah. I think it's very hard. Yeah, I mean, this situation... I think it's, if anything, it's shown the whole world how important music is to, to us, even just for our mental well-being. I mean, when you think about through history, in certain cultures and in certain times in history, music was banned. Music was banned in India for a while. Music was banned in Saudi Arabia for a while. Music was yeah. banned in China for a while. It's, it's like it's the ultimate form of suppression. You know, it's like you're basically saying that the citizens of your country cannot have fun. They cannot yeah. have enjoyment. They cannot have pleasure. And as a result of it, we're going to stop you playing music. 
which is fundamentally what the governments have done right now. Personally, I have mixed views on this current situation, um, but the one thing that is unquestionable, and you only have to go on the internet for a little while, is to see that millions and millions, if not billions of people are currently suffering because they can't see and hear music. Right, and, absolutely right. And out of everything that's going on in the world, and there is huge um, mistakes being made by governments, one of yeah. the biggest mistakes that is being completely ignored is that it's stopping music from being played. And to me, this is almost like a crime against humanity. This is the sort of thing that the worst tyrants in history inflicted upon their people. You cannot see music. You cannot listen to music. You cannot share music. You know, it's kind of something has to be done because this, this, this is unsustainable. Absolutely. And the point is also, I mean, there's a, a bunch of different styles and directions in music. If, it, if it's classic music, you know, uh, with violins, somebody likes piano music and stuff like this, some others, uh, dead metal, whatever, uh, no matter what, it's your decision. Um, yeah. What do you like and what, what makes you feel good? Because music makes you always feel good. It's always there. Music is always there. It should always be there. For sure. I agree. If you want to celebrate anything, if you want to do a party, you need music. And if you have bad times and if you, are, if you have a downtime, um, it's the more important it is in such moments, in such uh, periods of time that you uh, have something uh, you like. And music always takes you a little bit away, at least, at least for a moment. I mean, the two things that humans kind of have relied upon through the centuries is sport and music as being yeah. things that bring us together as humans, you know, and what this current situation is, is, is keeping humans away from each other. Um, yeah. And that's, yeah, it's, it's, it's really tough times. Um, I, <laughs> I, um, Searching memories, you know, uh, some clips that I took when I was on concerts years ago and things like that. I reviewed to that because and uh, I just think, well, it was a great time. And I don't, uh, I talked about the Dev Leppard concert. It was uh, in Munich. It was 70,000 people yeah. in the Olympic Stadium, um, this open air show. And I mean, I'm thinking about this crowd of people, of this audience um, singing along with the band is simply awesome. But yeah. I don't know if this will ever happen again. Yeah, I mean, I mean, th th that is a concept I can't even get my head around. You know, I can't, all I can- I can't accept it, no. I, I, I mean, it's like, all I can say is that we were blessed to live through everything that we've seen before. And I feel sorry for the, for the people that are missing out on, on all of this. Not only, not only the musicians, but the people that rely upon music as, as being something that keeps them, their mental health. You know, it, it's, yeah. it's vitally important for people. Yeah, and I mean, um, um, you mentioned you are 52 years old. I heard in between the lines uh, yeah. a couple of minutes ago. So you are, I'm 57, so we are more or less, we grew up at least exactly. with a short distance in between at the same time. And uh, I fully understand, I mean, what we took for granted. Um, you see how many things you took for granted, yeah. which are not. And that's, uh, and music is one of the special things, I mean, we, we had the chance to see bands, the great bands, the, the awesome bands in the 80s um, for a proper price and when they still were good. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we'd so, we be able to go and see the greatest bands in the world for five and 10 pounds and 20 yeah. pounds. Now people have to pay 200 pounds to go to a concert. And I mean, I, I remember I, I grew up with glam rock in the 70s with Sweet Slade, you know, the British bands. Um, with, uh, and the thing is, um, there was hard rock and pop and that's it so if you look nowadays you have I don't know a hundred different types of death metal trash metal whatever it is yeah. and the point is I'm, I'm old school I don't give a shit about that uh, to me it's I like it or not that's the point so it's still all for me rock music as a whole and that's it Yeah. and with all these all these definitions of, of sub genres and things like that um, I, I suppose that young bands, new bands, um, when they when they name their style, what they do, I, I read of styles I never heard in my life. <laughs> so and I, I can also imagine what 
what it sounds like, you know, when I read, when I read the term. So, um, but anyways, <clears throat> I think it's just a matter of um, being exposed a little bit from the rest, yeah. which is just normal because there's such a lot of great bands out. Uh, as, as Billy Joel said, it's still rock and roll to me. Yeah, nothing more, nothing less. I mean, and I see it with the, with the job that I'm doing uh, with Metal Crash Radio. There's such a band, uh, bunch of bands out there that are great, that are really awesome. And um, nobody, nobody recognizes it, nobody hears it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's tough, you know, even even with Shades of Grey, you know, because I'm doing everything myself, it is it is a, a battle, and I appreciate you uh, taking the time to talk to me and giving my music a little bit of exposure, so thank you very much. Um, my pleasure, and I appreciate your time. It was very interesting, and I, I could listen for hours to you. Um, great. Um, wish you best of luck, best thank of success. Thank you very much, Jürgen. And um, take care, especially. That's well, the most we're, important we're, thing at the moment. We're friends now, so there's no reason why we can't stay in contact. Yeah. So thanks a lot again, and uh, we'll stay in touch, definitely. Okay. Well, what I'm going to do now is press the button which says end record. Um, fingers crossed that it's yeah. stored on my hard drive, and then I'll send it. You're going to have to send me your email address. Yeah, I will send you a message. Okay. Right away then. All right, Jürgen. Thank you so much, brother, and stay strong. Enjoyed it. It was really great. Thank you. Thank All you right. so much, especially for the insight. Oh, my cool. pleasure. Thank you for your time. Very appreciated. Stay in touch. Bye, my friend. Bye-bye.